All right, here we go. We're going to the book of 1 Corinthians. This is our lectionary passage for uh, today, and we're going to uh, allow uh, the scriptures to certainly speak to us, hopefully in a powerful way, in a powerful way. Uh, Luke, uh, not Luke, I said 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 15. Uh, is where we will head, and we're going to spend uh, the next uh, few moments continuing in our uh, year-long theme of creating. Uh, how can you and I, particularly uh, we who are called to follow the ways of Jesus? All right, uh, how can we? Amen. Sound the same to me, praise God, but you know, no, nah, I'm playing. Thank you. Let's thank God for our, 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 our production team. They... They balance the things that even I cannot contemplate, praise God. Uh, but we are going to continue in our theme of creating in 2018. What does it mean for us to be people who are particularly um, engaging in this ministry uh, of uh, faithfulness uh, to God and certainly to uh, who God has called us to be? First Corinthians chapter number nine is where we'll head. This is a letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth. And uh, it is a, a city, Corinth, uh, particularly diverse as many parts of the Roman Empire had very uh, metropolitan spaces uh, filled with all kinds of practices and all kinds of teachings and ideologies and philosophies. And so the church in Corinth uh, was a church that was continuing to wrestle with what does it mean to uh, to follow Jesus and certainly be faithful in a space where uh, much of the, the, the calling of Jesus, dare I say, the claims of Jesus are contested. How many ever lived in a space where what you believe is contested? It is, it is meaning it is not settled. It is, it is up for discussion. Some may even uh, argue it is up for not just debate, but for conflict. And so this is a powerful and important part of uh, why I think the biblical texts are important because even though it was written to a culture thousands of years ago, uh, the scriptures have a particular eternal rev relevance that always brings you and I some form of enlightenment. Uh, the first six weeks of this year uh, are in the biblical or liturgical calendar uh, uh, called Epiphany. It is a season where we expect God to reveal some things to us in the liturgical calendar, in our, in our uh, purposeful worship, if you will, um, that we would rather or otherwise not receive in the normal course of our lives. And so we've you know, finished our consecration, and now we're moving into uh, the, the fulfillment of our call for this year. And I think this is an important text for us to uh, think a little bit about. First Corinthians chapter number nine, I'm reading from the message translation. The scripture simply says this, still I want it made clear that I've never gotten anything out of this for myself. Paul is talking to uh, the church in Corinth because there are some people who despise deeply Paul's ministry. And they're always trying to discredit Paul and they're trying to call Paul's ministry into question. And so Paul is making one of the many defenses of his ministry. Um, particularly, there are those who are saying that Paul is profiting. He's personally enriching himself financially with his own uh, uh, popularity. And Paul is, 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 is making a, a, a case that the reason why he's doing this is not for any amount of money or any earthly reward. So this is kind of what we're picking up in. Paul saying, I've never gotten anything out of this for myself and that I'm not writing now to get something. I'd rather die than give anyone ammunition to discredit me or impugn my motives. If I proclaim the message, it's not to get something out of it for myself. I'm compelled to do it and doomed if I don't. If this was my own idea of just another way to make a living, I'd expect some pay. Uh, how many of y'all ever been involved in something? It's like, you can't give me enough money to do what I'm doing. Hmm, yes, Lord. But since it's not my idea, 
but something solemnly entrusted to me, why would I expect to get paid? So am I getting anything out of it? Yes, as a matter of fact, the pleasure of proclaiming the gospel, the message at no cost to you. You don't even have to pay my expenses. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralists. That, that means, uh, you know, people who are, who are, uh, uh, can't remember what I'm about to say. Uh, meticulous, moralists, people who are legalists. You know, every folk who just, you know, drowning in legalism. Loose living immoralists. That's the rest of y'all, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. Somebody say whoever. whoever. Paul says, I didn't take on their way of life. Paul gives a little caveat. I kept my bearings in Christ. But I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all of this because of the message. I did all of this because of the message. I did all of this. Whew. That slid by me the first time I read it, so I'm just getting my own little Holy Ghost moment up here. Because of the message, I didn't just want to talk about it, I wanted to be in on it. Oof. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race, everyone runs, one wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard, they do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top conditions. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it, and then miss out myself. Ooh, this is the word of God. <coughs> For us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. Be to God. So we're going to talk from the topic, creating to win. Creating to win. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. Oh, God, and we'll say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Uh, if I were to give you another topic, I'd just say we in it to win it. Now, today, of course, is Super Bowl Sunday, and there are all kind of folk all across the country who are breaking their commitment to boycott, amen, the NFL. No, I'm just kidding. No, Super Sunday is a fascinating day. It is, one says, it is one of the most uh, uh, communal moments in our country's uh, annual uh, plethora of events that we use to amuse ourselves to death, amen, where we distract ourselves and we look at commercials and we look at two teams literally fighting for one prize. In Super Sunday, many folks, depending on your team of preference, you know, you'll have, uh, you know, great expectations, and other folks won't have any expectations because your team didn't win. Team didn't make it. Amen. My team, the 49ers, was far away. <laughs> Somebody say amen. And... You know, I don't feel this bad because there are some teams that came into this year with great expectations. And, and you know, I just don't know if it's better to have no expectation <laughs> or to have some expectation. Either way, you know, I'm just saying. 
We can talk about that later. <laughs> Amen. Because we don't want to get too distracted up in here. How many know you, you may win some and you may lose some? But when we talk about following Jesus and creating what God would call us to create, your winning and your losing is not dependent upon the outcome of a singular game. It's not even dependent on the outcome of a singular season of your life. How many of you know that we got a long time to make some decisions around how we will win? On if we will win. Maybe even more importantly, on what we will win. Because if, uh, you know, some of us are truthful, we've chased after a lot of things that we got, thinking we won. And now you're trying to get rid of it. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Award shows, Grammys, Super Bowls, there's... All these things that we can spend a lot of time chasing after. But we sing this old song said, only what you do for Christ will last. I know we don't have a lot of time, but, but Commission was one of my favorite groups. And they, they had a little song. I, I just want, want, want y'all to listen to the words of this song. Woo! My God. Jesus Christ will last. All right. If you want more of that, amen, we'll put that on the... On the, on the Facebook page, amen, but that's some powerful, powerful claims being made that only what you do for Christ will last. And, you know, there is indeed, I think, a very important uh, grounding that we all must continue to press into because there is indeed a competition for how you and I will spend the very limited time we have with the very priceless gifts we've been given. For many of us, there's a certain kind of truth to the reality that uh, we are living in a time, as Paul, where there are many who would try to put a price tag on what you are worth. And they'll try to reduce you or pump you up. And force you or cause you to lose sight on the original intent on why God has created you and I in the first place. We have been created for every day and moment of our life to give glory to God. Not just in the context of singing or attending church, but every day that you live, you are participating in the work that God has already started. And the challenge living in such a capitalistic, market-driven culture like ours is that we will join competitions and not be fully aware that our purpose has been hijacked for a project that is not God. Now, you know, it's important to appreciate in a competition, all of us are competing uh, and, you know, in a culture driven by scarcity like our culture, we can trick ourselves into thinking that we are each other's competition. So, you know, go back to Super Bowl analogy, you know, the New England Patriots, you know, who's you know, owners and, you know, quarterback, you know, supported Donald Trump, just in case you want to know that, praise God. Um, uh, 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 and, 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 and the Philadelphia Eagles, whose owner probably supported Donald Trump too, because all them guys, they're billionaires, they, you know, they, 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 they making decisions off their pocketbook. Uh -huh. So, you know, we just giving our money away to folk, amen, that, you know, pass policies, make sure we stay poor, amen. And, but this sermon ain't about that today. Amen. Uh. <laughs> My point is that they are 
competing for the Vince Lombardi Trophy. Only one team can come away victorious. And so many of us live our whole lives with that kind of scarcity framework. That there's only one victor at the end of this competition. But don't you know when God creates, God creates with abundance. So there are no losers in the economy of God. Because God always has enough for everybody to achieve their highest goal and aspiration. When you and I create then, we have to reject the economy of scarcity. The market forces that will even on your job make you think that the reason why you are working is to get more money in your pocket. So you can buy more things you don't need. Amen. And I know that's kind of relative, amen. Because uh, some of you like, Pastor, you don't know what I got. That's true. I don't know what you have. I don't know what you don't have. But I do know that none of us ever feel like we have enough. Even them billionaires is getting all these tax breaks, you know. Paul Ryan, he made a little quote, little tweet that he took down because he know he, he, he was ashamed of himself after folks made him ashamed. <laughs> Boasting of how a teacher was excited because she got a dollar fifty more a week because of the tax breaks that they gave to the billionaires. So they can get billions of dollars more a second. No, I'm just playing. Hey man, so, you know, a lot of this is relative. Of course, I'm not talking about that kind of economic exploitation, that kind of predatory kind of market capitalistic forces that, that, that would try to not uh, uh, reward or compensate or take care of the work that you are, are producing, per se. I'm not talking about you being exploited. I'm talking about what does it mean for you to not have your value totally defined? By you working on someone else's project that is not eternal. The way that, you know, uh, we, we are called to wrestle with this is vocation versus occupation. How many of you know that there's a difference between your vocation and your occupation? Now, there are very few folk out here who get to pick uh, their occupation solely based on their vocation. Some of us are called to do things that we do not get the opportunity to live out every day on a nine to five job. Hello, somebody. And then there are some who have the privilege, and it is a privilege, to wake up every day and do what you love to do and then get some money for it on the other side. And all of us should be mindful that we are living in a culture where not everybody gets to have that kind of privilege. Hello, somebody. Man, you know, there, there are some folk who, who don't like their job, don't like what they have to do in order to put food on the table to make their ends meet. They don't enjoy it, but they do it because they have a higher calling or purpose to achieve to make sure their basic needs are met, the needs of their children, the needs of their families. And so I want you and I to wrestle for a few moments uh, to make sure that we are not, you know, uh, rendering invisible the vocation, that which God's calling you to create for the sake of the gospel, and your occupation, that which you are often forced to do or you feel like you have to do in order to make your ends meet. I want to suggest to you today that the sooner you get in touch with your vocation, then you may find that you will never have an occupation that can't be used in the service of your vocation. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Because you may not get paid for what you're being called to do. Mm -hmm. You may not get paid. And, and truth be told, 
How much is your gift worth? At the end of the day, someone said, I'm always underpaid. Praise God. <laughs> I can have all kind of money. I can have all kind of benefits. But there's something about what God has placed in me that no one can put a price tag on. <laughs> Think about your experiences and all the things that you've been uh, able to overcome and all the things you've, you've come through. What would you uh, 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 put a, a, a price tag on to, to help fully reward you or compensate you for you coming through that depression? What, 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 what is it worth for you to come through on the other side of a campaign or a, or a, or a, a initiative to dismantle systemic and structural oppression? Or what, what is the, the, the price tag for, for, for your children uh, coming off crack or, or, or your, your family being reconciled together? Uh, some folk will make you think that, that everything can be defined by dollars and cents. But I, I believe there's something that God is doing that cannot be fully articulated <laughs> by the currency of a fallen world. And that's why you and I are being asked in this moment where we are being welcomed and invited and even compelled to participate in the creative work of God. What is it that we are being called to create? Now, it's important to appreciate that the economy of God will always rub against the economy of this world. And so that's why our lives have to be paradigmatic of who Jesus and how Jesus lived and not the, 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 the ways in which these failing economies that go out and in of style, depending on what era of time you live in, God's economy is eternal. So as we are celebrating and remembering communion today, how I many for 2,000 years the, the sacrifice of Jesus' body and blood has never lost its power or value? Woo. When Jesus says that this is my body that has been broken for you, Jesus is telling you that there's something eternal about the value of you living your life broken before God. Jesus said, this is my blood that has been, that has been poured out for you. Jesus said, there's something eternal about the value of your life being poured out as a living sacrifice. You could be a capitalist, you could be a socialist, you could be a, 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 a communitarian, you could be a, you don't know what you are. But, but, but the, 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 the value of what Jesus does stays consistent. And if your life is then being informed by the value of Jesus, how many know you have a form of consistency that is tried and true? So you being created to win in 2018 is really then about, the first point I'll say, how can you embrace your call to create? Somebody say embrace your call. Now, here in our, our, our kind of Protestant uh, traditions, we believe that uh, there is a priesthood of all believers. Meaning that there's not just one person who's called to engage in the divine priestly call of proclaiming the good news, of making disciples, of attending to a fallen and a broken world. Paul says it like this, that I have an obligation that has been laid on me and woe to me if I do not proclaim this gospel. Y'all know what woe to me means? It means I am in trouble. I am, I, I have a, 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 a certain kind of compelling force driving me that I couldn't say no even if I wanted to, although you could. But sometimes when you run away from your call, how many of you know you be like Jonah? <laughs> Trying to run away and you end up in a mess and you're like, okay, let me just say yes. 
begrudgingly I'll say yes. Hello, somebody. I think I said in Bible study on Wednesday that God's yes is, will always be your best. Some of us need to appreciate that like Paul, we all have been given a calling and we must embrace the call to be a proclaimer of a gospel message that creates life for all. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The gospel is not just concerned about your soul. It's concerned about your body. It's concerned about your mind. It's concerned about your family. It's concerned about those things that are of ultimate concern for you. But you have to embrace the call to live out God's divine purposes in your life. And when you are faithful to the divine purposes of God, you will be put in opposition to the forces of evil in our world. Somebody say, ouch, amen. Because, you know, a lot of us, we, 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 we risk averse people. So that's why we compromise so much. We, 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 we trying to get out of harm's way. Somebody say amen. Ain't nobody running into no trouble. Well, some of us are. We, we don't understand. We don't know that we run into trouble. But all of us, many of us, we trying to make decisions to avoid problems and avoid trouble. I want you to appreciate that there will be moments in your life where your vocation and your occupation will intersect in ways that help you proclaim God's message wherever you are. It is your call. You must embrace this call if you're going to create this year. God's not looking for schizophrenic, divided loyalties. I'm this way on my job, this way at home, this way at church, this way while I'm in the streets, this way while I'm in the club, this way when I'm with my friends, this way when I'm with my parents, this way when I'm at school, this way when I'm you know, in the lounge, this way when I'm at the gym, this way when, no, 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 no wonder you confused. <laughs> you can't keep up with all the different things you got going on. Could it be that God's asking you to make sure that what I've called you to do is also who I'm creating you to be. Or maybe we should flip that. What I'm creating you to be should be reflected in what you're being called to do. Huh. First thing then, the question I want you to wrestle with, the question simply is, does your vocation and your occupation intersect in 2018? And how is the gospel compelling you to create what can't be commodified? There's something this year that God's going to have you put out here, and folks are going to try to put a price tag on it. And you're going to have to make sure you don't sell out. You don't settle. Mm. Folks are going to try to, you know, lowball you on your value. Make you make these exchanges. But you better hold fast. You can't give me what I'm worth. So I'm going to hold fast and trust that the value of my faithfulness to God is far surpassing than the value of this compromise, this check, this distraction. Pat yourself on the chest and say, I got to embrace my call. I got to embrace my call. I got to embrace my call. Uh, second thing that you're going to have to do in 2018, if you're going to be able to create, is you're going to have to stretch yourself. Amen. They, 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 they talked a little bit about this in the alone uh, track. I didn't know what they was going to say. They didn't know what I was going to preach. But you, some of y'all just better just camp at this stretch yourself because it's already been confirmed by both those who were gifting us in their gift and the sermon. 
Verse number 22, I have become all things to all people that I by all means may win some. 2018, some of us are being invited to create some things for folk that are not like you. They're not like you. They're not like you. And how many know that sometimes when you are dealing with folk that aren't like you, they sure know how to stretch you. You didn't know you could stretch so much. <laughs> you sitting here like, I thought I had myself together. Then all of a sudden, you met them. And you're like, Lord. Obviously, there's some growing I have to do. Now, be mindful. I love the scriptures when they kind of underscore something that may be true for everyone, but for the child of God, it has a different kind of impact. Because it is true that all of us have to be stretched in a very pluralistic society. There is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all anything. It doesn't mean that there are no sense of truths, but it just means that some of us going to take our whole life to get to some truth that you may take a day. But don't get too hardy because there's something in your life that's going to take you your whole life to get to. So we got to create space for everybody to be stretched. But listen, it is stretched for the sake of the gospel. So by your stretching, you can help others into, enter into a God-saved life. So it is just not a stretching grounded in altruism. It is a stretching that is grounded in divine purpose. God wants to stretch some of us because there are some people God has placed in our lives that God, for some reason, believes your stretching can reconnect them to the eternal. Your stretching. Scripture says, I became all things to all people so I could win some. I'm not going to win everybody. So take the pressure off yourself to have to be winning everybody. Nobody wins all the time. So you're going to have some defeats. You're going to have some missed opportunities. But guess what else you're going to have? Some stretching. And in the stretching, it creates lots of creativity, possibilities to be unleashed. I had a mentor tell me, uh, you can only, well, not only. He didn't say only. He said, your capacity to reach folk can often be defined by 20 years you're senior and 20 years you're junior. I found that to be fascinating. You know, people tell you stuff, you don't really know if it's grounded in anything, but I really respect this person. And, uh, you know, I, and so I, he, when, when, when he said that, it resonated in my spirit. I was like, 20 years my elder, 20 years my junior. So there's a 40 year window I have of some form of relevance. I'm 42. So, you know, I can reach into the 60s and I can reach into the 20s, maybe a little bit into the late teens, amen. And 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 I and I, I can resonate with that because I used to feel like, you know, I was I was one of these cats that you know I can rock with young people like you know forever. And now I'm looking at some of these young people, I'm sounding like old folk. <laughs> what is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? You know, anyone ever realized that you were not in an age group any longer? Amen. You know, even teenagers, we always work with teenagers, and it, I'd, I'd be sitting in a room with a teenager who is in trouble, and that teenager would have the nerve to start talking about little kids, telling they're not raising these kids the way they need to be raised today. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. But it does at least suggest that some of us can only be stretched so far before we break. And I believe that God is not trying to break anybody. 
So if you are being stretched beyond your capacity and you're feeling like you're getting ready to break, it may be a little bit of a sign that you may have to move on and create space for those who will come later who are being stretched in an unbroken line of faithfulness. Hmm. Give your neighbor just a quick high five and tell them, Lord, stretch me, stretch me, stretch me, stretch me. I want to be stretched, but I don't want to break. All right. The, 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 the question that I want you, uh, 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 are you feeling the stretch to become all things to all people? How is this stretching informed by the gospel? So again, all your stretching must be informed by the gospel. It can't be informed by your own thinking. Because your own thinking is flawed. Just want you to know that. We're going to talk about that later, but just trust me. Well, how about this? Just think about your own thinking, and then you trust yourself. <laughs> Somebody say amen. How is the stretching informed by the gospel catalyzing your creative? It is the stretching that should catalyze your creativity to create that which necessarily must be created. And the final thing that we'll say, you've been... You must create to win. You've not only been created to win, but you must create to win. The scripture says, run in such a way that you may win it. So winning can be defined in a whole lot of ways. But again, in the economy of God, where there is no scarcity, winning then can be also described as you running in such a way where you don't be disqualified. And the scripture is very clear that there are some who run, but they run in such a way that they become disqualified. And if it is true that all you have to do is finish your race to get your reward, then all you need to do is run in a way where you do not get disqualified. And there are many things that can disqualify the child of God from their destiny. Disobedience. Rebellion, anger, unforgiveness can keep you locked into a situation where you can't finish what God has placed in front of you. But God needs somebody to make sure that I am so clear about what God has placed in my charge. That I'm not going to get caught up in the competition of this culture. The competition of these ideas that, that will pit you and I against one another. In, in our movement where we call it Oppression Olympics, where folks will, 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 will try to put their oppression next to the next person's oppression and try to make one oppression worse or better than the other. But how many of you know that's a narrative of scarcity? Hey Amen. It don't matter how much oppression you got in your back pocket. Oppression is oppression. It feels terrible to be oppressed. So I'm not going to engage in oppression Olympics because that may disqualify me from finishing my race. I'm not going to allow God's divine call in my life to get distracted by the hurt of other people, by the hurt even in my own self. But when I fall into a situation that causes me to lose course or lose focus, what I'm going to do is re capture my sense of divine calling and make sure that my creation, my creativity, my purpose is grounded in who God says I am and what God says I can be and who and what and where God calls me to be. So that's why I want you, child of God, to keep remembering what you've been created for. You've been created to win. You've been created to run your race. Whatever race God has placed in front of you, God has given you what it takes to win. So run your race and win it. Run your race and finish it. Run your race in such a way that it begins to unfold to all those who are around you a certain revelation about the true reality of who God is. And I'm here to tell you, God is real. God is not absent. God is not forsaken you. God has not dropped you off to your own devices. But God is real. 
somebody shout hallelujah. I remember Isaiah chapter 40 verse 27 uh, where the children of Israel were trying to figure out God where are you? Uh, they said why do you say oh Jacob uh, and why do you speak oh Israel uh, that your way is hidden from the Lord uh, and that your right is disregarded by God. Uh, oh, I love the prophet. He goes on to say, have you not known uh, and have you not heard uh, that the Lord is an everlasting God? Somebody say everlasting. Uh, that the Lord is a creator. Somebody says creator. Uh, and he does it until the ends uh, of the earth. Uh, he does not faint nor does he grow weary. Uh, his understanding is unsearchable. Uh, he gives power to the faint uh, and he strengthens uh, the powerless. Uh, so even the youth will faint uh, and they will grow weary uh, and the young will fall by the wayside because they are exhausted. Uh, but they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they will not faint. Do I have a witness in the house today that can look back over your life a few days ago? Look back over your life a few weeks ago and declare that just when I fought uh, I was down to my last straw. Uh, God stepped in uh, and he gave me the strength I needed uh, to keep on running this race, uh, to keep on walking this path, uh, to keep on flying uh, my journey. Uh, so child of God, just keep on pushing. Uh, just keep on walking. Uh, just keep on believing. Uh, for God will uh, give you what you need. God will open whatever door must be open. God will give you the joy you need in the midnight hour. God will ease the troubled mind. God will heal your body. God will open up the door. God will do whatever he's promised because I believe God devil you can keep your lies haters you can keep your haterism but I will wait for the Lord and be of good courage because he shall he shall he shall strengthen my heart somebody shall God will somebody shall God can somebody shall God is a Stand with me real quick. Stand and grab the hand of someone next to you. Grab somebody by the hand and just squeeze their hand and tell them, I believe God has created you to win. Say it again. I believe God has created you to win. No losers in this row. No deficits in this row. Whatever you have in your hand, God says, I can enlarge that. I can stretch that into a winning formula. So just begin to squeeze their hand lightly and say, God, give them what they need. Give them what they need. Give them the joy they need. Give them the strength they need. Give them the focus they need. May they not be driven by the false narratives of this time, of this season, but may they have everything they need for life and godliness. Oh, Jesus. Well, thank you, God. Well, thank you, Lord. Bless the loved one who I'm touching. 
I pray, God, that everything that they are being called to do, God, will be unleashed in them in such a way that whatever they're being paid to do will bend inside their vocation. Whatever their divine purpose is, God, may their divine purpose inform and feed their daily practices and activities. This is our prayer, God. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus. And God, I'm also asking you to remind us, remind us, God, that we are people who are already invited into your work of creation. Whether we're teachers, whether we're students, whether we are professionals, policymakers, activists, parents, no matter what our social cause or assignment may be for this season, may our vocation outlast our assignments. Oh, that's what I hear God saying to somebody. God saying, I want your vocation to outlast your assignment. I want you to have an eternal sense of what you are divinely called to do so it can outlast the seasons of where you find yourself placed. So we'll say yes, Lord. We'll say yes to your will. We'll say yes to your way. We'll say yes, we'll go. We'll do, we'll say whatever. You say, now lift those hands, it's me, oh Lord, I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister. It is not my brother. But it's me, oh Lord, and I need you, God. Visit visit me. If you're not a follower of Jesus today and you want to make that decision, just open up your heart right now and tell the Lord, Lord, come into my life. Make me brand new. Forgive me for all that I've done. I want to live according to your ways. I want to accept the free gift of salvation. I want to be part of your eternal family and kingdom. Some of you are already following Jesus and you say, I need to get on my creating path. I'm, I'm wasting time. I'm, I'm avoiding my call because my call does not feel like it fits my life. Oh, I'm here to tell you today that God can make your vocation and your occupation merge together in a way for greater faithfulness. Some of you may be here today and you're being stretched. And I do hear God saying for some of us, the stretching is necessary because you don't have enough compassion and heart for the lost around you. So God is saying, I'm going to stretch you until... Your heart has enough room to love. Your heart has enough room to heal. God, whatever you're doing in us, do it. And we'll say yes. We'll say yes. And even God, as we prepare to receive the body and the blood that has been broken for us, may we recall to mind the scripture that recounts that we have received from the Lord what we also give to you. 